uniting America with truth, justice, and independence. This is the Norman Goldman Show. In today's big Supreme Court ruling on affirmative action, what the Supreme Court did in fact say was, look it. Texas wants racial diversity, at least the University of Texas does, in its system. So because the legislature and the University of Texas recognize that Texas, like the rest of America, is a very racially segregated place. There are neighborhoods that are predominantly black. There are neighborhoods that are predominantly Latino, neighborhoods predominantly white. And in these various segregated neighborhoods, there are schools. And so the schools are predominantly black or predominantly Latino or predominantly white. Because the University of Texas recognized that the, the neighborhoods and the schools are organized along racial and ethnic lines, the University of Texas came up with a system. They call it the top 10 system. And they said, okay, every top 10, 10% who graduate, the top 10% from every high school is guaranteed admission to the UT system. And because there are some racially segregated, many racially segregated schools, the top 10 in a predominantly black or Latino school guaranteed admission, that will give the University of Texas a very racially diverse class. And it worked. And it's worked. I got to tell you, it has worked because Texas, like the rest of America, racially segregated housing, thereby racially segregated schools. And so when this case got to court, when Abigail Fisher sued the University of Texas saying, you kept me out because I'm white. It went to the Supreme Court, but before it got to the Supreme Court, it went through the lower layers, the two lower layers of federal courts. When it was in the Court of Appeal, the Court of Appeal looked at the University of Texas system and they said, you know what? Makes sense. What they, what I just described to you is a very quick summary of what the court record said. And the, the court right below the Supreme Court, the layer right below the Supreme Court, the Court of Appeal said, you know what? That makes sense. So we will defer because the University of Texas knows what they're doing to get racial uh, diversity. We are not going to boss them around. So that's fine. It gets to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, you know what, Court of Appeal, you were too deferential. You just bent over backwards just to let the uh, university do what they wanted. You didn't want to get involved. You didn't employ the exacting scrutiny that is demanded when racial classifications occur. Now, please remember that racial classifications used to be going the other way, right? This is why we have what's known in the law as strict scrutiny. When there is a racial classification, The courts give what is known as strict scrutiny, and it's very hard for a law that is based on a racial classification to to get past strict scrutiny. Because it used to be blacks need not apply for these jobs. Blacks need not apply to vote here. Right. So the courts over the many years since the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act in 64 and 65, the the courts have said, you, you know, hey, wait a second here. Because these laws are discriminatory against black people. And because we know, as courts, we know the history of racial animosity in this country. When we come across these laws, we're going to apply what's called strict scrutiny. And the the people that wrote these laws and want to enforce them are going to have to give us some really good reasons why a classification based on race is legitimate. And whenever a court would declare that strict scrutiny applies, that pretty much means the law is not going to survive. It's really hard to get a law past strict scrutiny. Well, now the Republicans are taking that and turning it on its head and using it as a weapon. They're turning it right around, doing a 180 and using it as a weapon, saying, oh, look at this affirmative action. It's a racial classification. It's it's there to help black people and it's discriminating against white people. So you got to apply strict scrutiny. And that's the way the law has been. So today, the court said, not only are you going to apply strict scrutiny, you're really going to apply strict scrutiny. So it was eight judges, and it was a seven to one decision. Anthony Kennedy wrote the decision for the seven, and he said, hey, strict scrutiny when it comes to affirmative action now means that you have to exhaust every other possible way of doing what you want to do without a racial classification, meaning without regard to race. You've got to do every other thing you possibly can. And if you then, after trying every other way you possibly can, then you can't do it, then you can do something that accounts for race as a factor. But the court has to 
put you through each and every hoop. The court has to put you through all these hurdles to say, what did you do before you went to the racial classification, before you said we're going to give black people or, or Latinos or minorities any kind of extra helping hand because of who they are? What else did you do? And you better show us each and every step of the way. The court today required the lower courts to basically be real pains in the rear end to the uh, various government entities or the or the public schools or private schools that get federal money to say, we're going to make your life miserable if you use a racial classification. So what the court did today was basically turn the wrench really tight. They didn't say we're getting rid of affirmative action. They said, we're going to go one more step to just tighten and tighten and tighten to make it ever more difficult for you to use racial classification to try and redress all of the damage we've done to everybody who's not white in this nation for so many decades. What the court did today was essentially say to all of the institutions that are not courts, that want to use race as a factor to try and redress the historic imbalance, the historic discrimination against black people, Latinos, and so forth, the court said, if you do that, you're in for years of very exacting litigation. The courts are, We have ordered the courts to make your lives miserable. We've ordered the courts to sniff your shorts. We've ordered the courts to undress you and examine your shoelaces and every article of clothing. So basically, why don't you just not go there? That's what's really going on here. The court, without getting rid of affirmative action in name, basically got rid of affirmative action by saying, ah, we're going to make it so difficult for you to use it. You're not going to want to use it. But there's one other thing at issue here. You'll recall the Citizens United case from January 2010, where the Supreme Court took a very narrow case about Hillary the movie from a group called Citizens United, a very narrow case. This group, this little group called Citizens United, raised a bunch of corporate money, and they wanted to basically distribute a movie saying very, very nasty things about then perceived to be the winning candidate for president, Hillary Clinton. They came up with this long before the Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton thing was going on. This group, Citizens United, thought Hillary was going to be the nominee in 2008. So they did this, you know, basically a slanderous hit piece on her. And they use corporate money. Now, under the McCain-Feingold law, as it existed in those days, because there was some corporate money involved, they couldn't show it during certain windows of time relative to the election. The Supreme Court took that case, and all they had to do was say, no, that portion of the McCain-Feingold Act is too restrictive of free speech, so we're just going to set it aside, go ahead. But what the Supreme Court did was they said, no, 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 no. I know the case is fully briefed. I know it's been orally argued. We know it's ready to be decided, but that's not the case we want to decide. We want to decide a much broader case. So go on back and brief this much broader issue that nobody has raised, that we ourselves are raising, because this is what we want to do. Now, that's a violation of Article 3 of the Constitution. It's an impeachable offense, in my humble opinion, because the Supreme Court is supposed to be very passive. Courts are supposed to be passive. They're only supposed to decide things brought to them by the litigants, by the people suing each other, by the lawyers for the litigants. They're supposed to just decide what has been given to them, what's been offered up to them. They are not free agents out there saying, you know, today we'd like to decide this question. So why don't you all go write up your legal briefs and then we'll decide this question. They can't do that. It's in Article 3 of the Constitution. It says the court decides only cases and controversies. You can't just make up your own. There's a ton of law cases out there from the Supreme Court through the centuries saying we only decide what's been put before us and we decide it in a very narrow way. Just the most narrow decision. We don't issue these broad sweeping things. Well, in the Citizens United case, they did exactly the opposite. They took a case and they opened it wide open. And then they decided the case they wanted to decide. And they did it all in one fell swoop and look at the uh, look at the fallout. The Supreme Court has the public. Half the public thinks they're politicians in ropes. You can count me in that group. And on top of that. The chief justice, John Roberts, is very sensitive now. He is concerned about the Supreme Court as an institution, and he is seeing the backlash to the Citizens United case where, you know, all these cities, including my own here in Los Angeles, we're passing resolutions demanding Congress give us a constitutional amendment overturning the Citizens United case, and it's picking up steam. The chief justice is paying attention. And he realizes he made a big mistake. He realizes that he overstepped, that he tried to do too much. He bit off more than he can chew when he said, Corporations are people, my friend. So he's decided to go small. 
What the chief justice is doing is saying, I want to be a judicial activist. I am a Republican. I'm going to protect big business, but I've got to do it in tiny little steps. I can't do it all at once like in Citizens United. It's too big. It's too obvious. It engenders too much political opposition. It gets people saying that I'm a politician. I've got to slow it down. I've got to go slow. And by the way, John Roberts, the new chief justice, is only 58 years old. We're stuck with this dude for another 20 years. 20 years! He'll be 70 eight years old and he'll still be the chief justice so he's sitting there going hey i'm gonna just do this in little bits and pieces and today's ruling on affirmative action is one of those little bits and pieces that is the new way of the supreme court and by the way to cover his tracks every once in a while he's going to rule against the other republicans like in obamacare but besides i can't do another five to four that is so divisive because then the supreme court's uh credibility will be shot to nothing so understand we are we've got to get used to this little step at a time thing but what's going on here today is affirmative action is being eroded away to nothing it's being disintegrated before our eyes one step at a time uniting america with truth justice and independence this is the norman goldman show